Unlike sex or food, it has historically done nothing directly to help our ancestors survive. And yet, music and its effects are present virtually across all cultures. So it must satisfy some sort of universal need. Humans have been making music for tens of thousands of years, going back to prehistoric times. And judging by the fact that an infant responds so calmly to a lullaby, or that the average American teenager spends one-eighth of their waking life listening to music, it certainly seems like music is hardwired within the human. Some scholars have argued that music is really just a secondary adaptation to language for the human species. I believe music evolved independently and is more than just a byproduct to language. Music is playing a primary role within the individual, within society, and within medicine. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at music's role within the individual. First, let's start by looking at your body's physiological response to music. As Brian and I were jamming on the drums, your pupils were dilating, your pulse was quickening, your breathing rate was increasing, your blood pressure was rising, and blood was being redirected to the muscles in your legs and in your arms. And what about your brain? How was it processing the music? As the rhythms were circulating through the room and into your ears, those sounds were being broken down into signals that were then being transmitted by the cochlear nerve into your brain. Now to really understand exactly how music is processed in the brain, let's take a look at the real human brain. This is the front of your brain, and this is the back of your brain. As we were saying, those sounds are being broken down into signals that are then transmitted by that cochlear nerve and eventually into an area of the brain known as the auditory cortex, which lies right here in this small space called the temporal lobe. Now to really understand what structures of the brain are activated by music, it's best to look at a half section of the brain. It turns out music activates an area in the brain known as the nucleus accumbens, which is responsible for releasing the pleasure chemical dopamine. Dopamine is your go get em neurotransmitter. It's what makes you feel good when you're exercising, or you're eating, or you're listening to a good song, or you're having sex, or you're trying an addictive drug. Music also activates a more primitive, ancient structure within our brains known as the amygdala which is responsible for attaching emotions to our sensory experiences. And finally, music activates a more advanced structure in our brain known as the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for doing your abstract decision making and your critical thinking. So what's really going on here is that music is tying your most advanced areas of your brain to the most ancient primitive structures in your brain. And what's really fascinating about this as that research has shown that the songs that create the strongest response emotionally and intellectually do so by creating a reward through pattern prediction and pattern recognition. 
So what do I mean by that? Well, essentially, as an unfamiliar piece of music is unfolding in time, your brain is getting pleasure from being able to predict how that song is going to continue to unfold. What's even more remarkable is that researchers up at McGill have shown that there are separate areas in the brain that are responsible not only for the anticipation of the song, but for the peak experience of the song itself. So from all of this, I think it's pretty clear that there's an intrinsic physiological response in all of us with regards to music. But then how does music really benefit society? Well, to understand that, I think we need to look at the evolutionary basis of music. It was actually Charles Darwin who was the first one to say that music is definitely related to sexual selection. Think about it. Music is most comparable to the mating calls of other species. Birds being your best example. However, from an evolutionary point of view, music makes absolutely no sense. It's loud, it's noisy, it might attract predators, or it could incite competition amongst other musicians. So really, music is sort of acting like a peacock's feathers, bright and intended to help you find a mate, and less for the purposes of natural selection. So what else could be the benefit of music to society? Well, to understand that, I think we should all participate in a group rhythm making challenge together. I'll be playing the bass rhythm, and you guys will follow in response to Brian. Those of you who don't have drums, feel free to clap along or pat on your legs. Oxytocin is responsible for mediating trust and reducing anxiety. So you can see how something like this would be helpful in social bonding. But why would something like this evolve? Well, the current theory is that our ancestors, who were good at group music making, had better group cohesion. So they did better at things like hunting and warfare, which helped them to survive. So, so far, we have seen there's a clear intrinsic response within the individual to music. There are tremendous benefits to society for music. So then the real question is, how do we harness that music within us and apply it to treatments in medicine? As a medical student, we learn about the concept of neuroplasticity, which is the idea that the brain has the ability to change itself in response to different stimuli. In his famous book, Musicophilia, by Dr. Oliver Sacks, a world-renowned neurologist, he describes music and its ability to heal the human brain. Imagine Miss Rosalie B., a 63-year-old woman with Parkinson's disease that started just as a simple hand tremor, but gradually worsened to the point where she could no longer do her daily activities, like cutting her vegetables, putting on her makeup, or typing at her computer. Now the disease is so severe, she can't stand, she can't walk, she can't speak. She spends most of her days with her hand on her forehead, bent over, and frozen. In patients like this with Parkinson's disease, the healing potential of music is vast. According to Dr. Sachs, the most critical component of music for these patients is actually rhythm. And that makes sense, because in patients with Parkinson's disease, the damage is in the motor pathway of the brain, which makes it really difficult for these patients to initiate sequences of movement. 
What's even more interesting is that not all music is created equally in patients with Parkinson's disease. In fact, the best music is free, smooth flowing, with a well-defined rhythm. Turned out Mrs. B could play Chopin as a young girl, and now when placed in front of the, that piano, she could still play in spite of her debilitating disease. So now knowing this about music's ability to change the brain in a patient with Parkinson's disease, imagine the impact something like an iPod could have in making the daily activities of these patients achievable. Next, take Mr. Samuel S., a 65-year-old man who suffered a stroke to the left side of his brain, robbing him of the ability to walk or talk. The doctors had told Mr. S. that he may not be able to speak again. Many sufferers of stroke often lose the ability to read, write, understand speech, or even speak. For Mr. S., this was a stark contrast to the life he had known as a professor, where he was giving lectures pretty regularly. What we know about aphasia, or the loss of ability to talk, is that it usually results from damage to the left side of the brain, where the language component is typically located. But research has shown that the brain has this remarkable capacity to remodel itself after injury, and that music, in fact, can tap into that healthy right side of the brain and indirectly activate the damaged left side of the brain. So Mr. S started taking singing classes in an effort to regain his speech. In this melodic intonation therapy, he would sing common phrases like please or thank you, with the eventual goal of removing the music from the lyrics. Unlike the patient with Parkinson's disease where that music was directly activating that damaged motor pathway, here the most critical component of music is to have structured phrases and intonation. So in this way, the words that had been lost from within Mr. S could now be regained through music. Finally, let's take a look at Mrs. L, a 73-year-old woman who was brought in by her brother for worsening memory impairment and Alzheimer's disease. Over the last three years, her brother had noticed a gradual decline in her memory and a difficulty, a difficulty in finding words. Mrs. L did not like to admit that she was having a hard time, but even her friends started to notice a decline in her personal grooming, her housekeeping skills, and her ability to manage her finances. As the disease progressed, she began to lose her identity, her stories, and her memory. Almost all of her memory was gone, except for music. Mrs. L started working with a musical therapist who would play songs from her past. It was remarkable to see a smile light up on Mrs. L's face as she was transported back in time to that happy childhood memory. The areas of the brain that respond to music that we described earlier are similar to those that are responsible for things like emotion, mood, and memory. So it makes sense that our personal memories are often embedded within the songs that we once learned to sing or play. Unlike the patient with Parkinson's disease or the patient with aphasia, here the most critical component of the music is to be able to evoke those emotions, those thoughts, and those memories by association with the music. So in this way, the past that could not be recovered in other ways can now be recovered through music. So from these examples, it seems to me music is so much more than just a byproduct of language. Music is playing its own primary role within the individual, within society, and within medicine. Music may not have the potency of an antibiotic, but it certainly has the capacity to heal the human brain. Music not only carries our hopes and our dreams, our joys and our sorrows, our successes and our failures. Music has the ability to connect us to our roots, to carry our most cherished memories, to move our bodies, and to heal the human brain. As we were playing the drums together today, I could feel those rhythms echoing the music from within all of us. And I believe that if we could find that music here today, together, then everybody can. So my challenge to you is that the next time you're listening to a song, feel all that it is, from the smallest cell in your body, to the love that you share with your significant other, to the basic movements of your body, to your most fondest memories, 
and start to recognize the inner patterns and the music that is in within, within all of us. Thank you.